of Chinese art. And uh, I think we have to compare trends in prices, popularity, and availability. Of appraising special categories could be a very dangerous area, especially when we're very much involved with very rarefied pieces. Um, just a point of information, I would think that people who are involved in general appraisal work should, in fact, consult specialists when it comes to that field, rather than just take a uh, shot at the dark. Uh, I know a lot of appraisers, many times when it comes to prices, have a tendency of maybe going to auction catalogs to justify their price structure. Uh, I think that is good to a degree. Uh, again, we're dealing with um, such diversity when it comes to <coughs> Chinese art uh, that, that again, we've got to separate what is a great piece from what is a mediocre piece and what is just not worth very much. And yet again, each piece could be thousands of years old. And I think we've got to learn to separate in that sort of category. I find that also prices are very, very strongly depending upon the location and the styles of collecting. And uh, yet I believe, as Sylvia mentioned just a moment ago, that uh, Chinese art is probably one of the most stable and basically because of its broad international scope. Uh, we're so regulated by international economics, uh, I find that uh, sometimes that a piece that could have been very popular only yesterday uh, could totally change its aspect because uh, the market, the availability in a certain area or a depression or a recession in a certain country uh, could affect that market. You may only have a few important buyers for, let's say, uh, some Tang Dynasty wares, I think specifically in this term, of the Japanese, uh, who were the major buyers in the last eight, ten years of important Japanese, important Chinese Tang tomb figures. And uh, prices escalated to the point that a Tang horse at Sotheby in London, <coughs> one that was in the British rail collection, actually sold for $5.9 million. Um, my personal feeling is I don't believe any horse, and this was a great one, should derive that sort of price. But this was just at the point before the Japanese market went into a decline. And there's a, when you talk about the Japanese at this uh, moment, I mean, just to use them as a sort of a um, focal point, uh, when they were at the peak of buying, there was no stopping them. I don't care what, I mean, anybody that's in the field of, of paintings, the Western paintings, whatever it was, they found the Japanese uh, so involved in prices going uh, sort of to the sky uh, with no holding back. Uh, now, aside, even those that have the, the fortitude and the money to spend money uh, find themselves conservative because aside from being for the first time since World War II in a recession, they had also gone through some recent scandals, both politically and in business, uh, uh, that had a very strong effect on their market. Uh, even as I said, those with the ability to spend uh, would be embarrassed to do so. At the very same time, I sort of have to pay attention to where the next market will be. I think, the, as we've all been reading, the uh, strong gains in China, especially in southern China, um, there is a very much a free enterprise movement occurring, and it will be most logical for the Chinese and those who are affluent in the future to be buying back much of their own art. And where they will turn to, believe it or not, will be probably to the West. 
which will certainly escalate prices in important pieces. Uh, there's another area which I just like to cover as well. Uh, when the uh, tomb figures, the Ming Chi wares, uh, declined in the last couple of years, uh, aside from the fact that the Japanese are out, there's also another reason. In the last, I would say, 15 years, there was such an influx of tomb raiding uh, that the market became sort of flooded. Uh, whereas, uh, unless a piece was of major quality, prices within the last couple of years have declined just because of too much on the market. Uh, the Hong Kong and the Taiwanese, they have their own way of collecting, and they don't buy tomb figures. Number one, it's uh, sort of, no, no one collects tomb figures. It's sort of like digging up your ancestors, and that's sort of not uh, uh, the way of their direction. What is most appealing to Chinese from Hong Kong and Taiwan is collecting uh, Qing Dynasty wares in the last few years. And prices there, I mean, for Mark, and I gotta emphasize when I say Qing Dynasty porcelains, I'm talking about Mark and period pieces made for imperial consumption. This is somewhat like stamp collecting. Um, condition is so important. If a piece has a minuscule little chip, it's could be reduced in price, $100,000. Uh, it has to have the proper mark. It has to be so beautifully decorated. Uh, the first of these mark and period pieces to achieve uh, high prices were uh, basically monochromes. And within the last year or two, I noticed that um, uh, Wutsai and Daozai wears, the multicolored wares, four or five colors, uh, again, with mark and period, again, pristine condition has come to the fore and bringing astronomical prices primarily to those markets. Another area that I'd like to uh, touch is um, what I consider today to be undervalued in Chinese art. Chinese paintings only in the last few years, and we're talking about some great masters, uh, in many cases, paintings that have survived from the Tang Dynasty and uh, through into current contemporary Chinese painters. Some great, great works, some great masters, as I say. Um, and at very best, some of the most expensive Chinese paintings have only gone as high as $1.65 million on public sale. There's only three that I know at the moment, three or four old masters that have achieved that sort of number, and one contemporary that came very close to that. Uh, the record, the $1.65 million that sold a few years ago, and I'd rather keep this information general, um, was later questioned as to its authenticity. Paintings as scholarly and erudite as it may be, is a very dangerous area, even to those that know what they're doing. And the chances are, when you get five experts in a room discussing Chinese paintings, you'll probably land up with six or seven opinions. <coughs> Another area that I find tremendously <coughs> undervalued is Chinese furniture. Furniture that we're talking about the uh, 15th century, <coughs> excuse me, um, Middle Ming Dynasty and through into the early Qing Dynasty. We're dealing with furniture that was made without nails, that was all so beautifully mitered and fitted together, simple in design with some very careful carving when necessary and the type of woods that we used were some of the very best woods that far exceeded, in my opinion, American and European woods. I'm talking about some of the most dense woods imaginable for carving. 
Uh, probably the champion of that is Zitan wood, which was primarily used during the late Ming and into the 19th century. And it was basically used originally for imperial consumption and filtered down to only those of noble stature. It's a very deep, hard, almost black looking uh, purple sandalwood. That if you look carefully, there's a tone of purple to the wood. Uh, it is said that it's so dense that it's probably the only wood that would truly sink if you submerge it. The finish is unbelievable, the way it polishes. It is so, it grew so tight together, it would take, believe it or not, a tree of maybe 12 inches to grow, uh, to develop in about 600 years. That's how tight and hard that wood is. Unfortunately today, there are some uh, Zitan trees that, forests that are uh, available, but obviously none of the age that we're talking about. So you're dealing today with young Zitan. Uh, Huang Hua Li wood was also used for both uh, imperial and filtered down to the wealthy class. And this is the type of wood that was in the best of homes from the middle of the Ming Dynasty, figure about 15th to 16th century, and carried on to about 17th, 18th century. Again, it's a uh, blonde rosewood, and um, there are, again, some other woods that have been found today, basically in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, the Huang Guali variety, uh, but there is something about that old wood that was just unbelievable. Um, much of the European designs, the cabriole leg, the slapback, developed from Chinese furniture. And when we talk about the price, uh, I, some of you may know better than I when it comes to this, but I'm sure that we are all aware that some American and European <coughs> furniture have sold in the neighborhood of 10 to $20 million. The highest price I know publicly for a Chinese piece of wood, for Chinese furniture, sold recently in Hong Kong, a Zitan screen, large screen, it was a thrown back screen, <coughs> sold for close to $300,000. Amazing. I had purchased at Sunbees uh, about a year, a little over a year ago, a Zitan table absolutely for imperial use, 18th century, it was about eight feet long, and we had paid, it came to $176,000, which was beneath the estimate, I thought their estimate was kind of high, and we were very fortunate to get it. And we sold it for 250,000, which is probably as far as a utilitarian piece of furniture, the highest price on the market. I'm amazed at that, that dispar disparaging uh, difference here we're talking about uh, between 250,000, 300,000, and up to $20 million for Western furniture. Um, when I talked of paintings, obviously we all know that uh, what was it? it was a Van Gogh that sold for $84 million. And again, that there is that strong variance uh, in, in Chinese paintings when we talk about under two million dollars. Uh, I believe that within the next five years, as soon as we get a strong economy going again, I really feel that Chinese paintings will one day in that period exceed five million dollars to ten million dollars. The other area that I also think has been uh, understated uh, in quite a while, uh, is archaic jade. In 1983, the Richard Bull collection came on the market. This was an important Philadelphia collection. And it brought terrific high prices for archaic jades, as well as later jades. And I thought at that time uh, that might set a new trend. Unfortunately, I found out all it did was recognize that collection 
rather than the terrific objects that followed thereafter. Another thing I find that has um, tremendous influence on, uh, in the Chinese market is um, various exhibitions that are conducted by museums and highly publicized today. And, uh, leading dealers, I know we, we get a kick out of doing this, of doing exhibitions in our gallery and using that as a point of education as well as uh, advertising. Uh, and always looking for something important and new to be highlighted. And obviously auction houses too, uh, as well, uh, are always looking to promote and educate in that matter. Uh, I remember about 15, 20 years ago, generally, especially in the auctions, the auction rooms, people would sell items more for the substance, what that piece was, as opposed to <coughs> its use. I'm thinking specifically now of uh, an area that we were very much part of. Uh, that was uh, Chinese writing implements, something I would like to refer to as uh, in scholar's taste. And there were only about, in that time, maybe 15, 15 20 years ago, no more than maybe a couple of dealers around the Western world that had any sort of knowledge and input in that area. Um, we personally had collected writing implements going back about 25 years. And that became, in essence, a theme to highlight what we do in our gallery as well. Um, there's another dealer who worked out of Hong Kong before in London named Hugh Morse. Uh, that also in the 60s and 70s was very much uh, in the forefront of these scholar table pieces. Uh, it's both satisfying and a little bit sad to find that the auction houses and museums now highlight things for scholar states, things for writing uh, implements, uh, in their shows and exhibits. The reason why I say it's a little sad, uh, the fact that we helped to highlight this, became, the end result is we have since had to pay the price for its success. At this point, what I, I think rather just keep talking, I think uh, it might be fun to just talk uh, and look at slides at the same time and I can sort of highlight trends and why things sell for the way they do. No, I'm not clicking yet. I'm going to start the slide lecture uh, segment uh, with paintings. Since it's a very big favorite of mine, I allow my prejudice to take over. Um, this first slide that we're looking at is an anonymous calligraphy. Uh, it's in the Kaishu uh, manner, it's, uh, which is regular script. Uh, it is of the Tang Dynasty. Um, if you don't mind, I mean, I'll just, as I go along, I'll just mention, when I mention a dynasty, uh, chances are I'll just mention the, the dating as well, if it's easier for you. Uh, the Tang Dynasty being 618 to 906. And um, this is a section, and uh, uh, I bring this up specifically because with all this age involved, uh, most of you might feel that it's probably terribly expensive. Uh, it was estimated, it sold at Sotheby's in 1988, and it was estimated to sell for $1,500, and it sold for $1,400. Very reasonable, considering we're dealing with something uh, quite easily uh, 12, 1,300 years old. And that's just the 
other section of that same scroll. Uh, we're looking here at a Buddhistic painting. It's, uh, it was sold at Sotheby's in 1989, and, uh, in December, and identified as anonymous as far as the painter, which in, in, in effect, just about all Buddhist paintings are anonymous. Um, they gave it a question mark as, as to its date of 13th, 14th century, and also put a question mark next to um, its attribution. They thought it may not be Chinese, it may be Korean. With that in mind, the Koreans have just at this time started to really get into the art world. Uh, their economy, as you all know, is booming in the last many years. They have sort of become the Japan of the latter uh, 80s and into the 90s. And uh, it was referred to as Buddha and attendants. And it was estimated at twenty to $30,000. And it sold, with Koreans bidding all over the place, for $460,000. I don't think anybody in his right mind would have expected it. Funny feeling is, now the Korean buying has cooled off a bit in the last year or two. If it were put back on the market, I wonder if it would bring 100000 This is a terrific painting. It's not a very big painting. And that's another thing, too, uh, with paintings, and I think it's probably so with Western art as with Chinese. Size, many times, has to do with value, amongst other things. Uh, this is a painting by an early Ming master, one of the really great Ming masters, an artist named, named Shen Zhou. Uh, I remember back maybe about 10, 12 years ago, a good Shen Zhou would bring easily six, early, low six figures. Uh, this painting sold as a bargain uh, in June of 92 at Christie's, uh, and it was estimated at 60 to 80,000, and I think I got a world bargain here. We paid $38,000 for it. Um, this painting is by uh, Wu Wei, and uh, Wu Wei's dates are 1459 to 1508. So again, we're right here in this middle Ming period, and it's two figures beneath the willow. Um, Wu Wei was a terrific um, 